Y'all planning for this? Welcome back, TPR Nation, to another amazing episode of What Works Wednesday. If you notice the wonderful voice talking to you now, this is not Matthew Jarvis, but Micah Shalansky. And I got a special guest with us here today, visiting in person to Wasilla, Alaska, under a home under construction, uh, Stephen Jarvis with Retirement Tax Service. Stephen, thanks for joining us, bud. Yeah, thanks for bringing me all the way to Alaska to do a podcast. I know, right? Who knew we could do this online? It, nope, it has to be in person. In person, for sure. Well, Stephen, you've been hanging out in our office this week. We've been going out and doing some other fun stuff, but uh, some really cool things have kind of come up with that. We've talked about processes and how advisors can play a, a more key role in the tax preparation process, even if you're not doing preparation. Uh, we've talked about IRS letters that clients have get. We've talked about training your teams. Uh, we've talked about, you know, other different power sessions that are coming up. Some really exciting things that are going to be there, but really the overall arching concept of this is tax planning and what the advisor should be or shouldn't be doing for that role. Yeah, this is a, a topic I love to nerd out on, Micah. I mean, so glad that we can have this conversation because it's it's clearly it's one that comes up for me a lot. I'm a CPA, so my whole life people have assumed that all I do is taxes. So thankfully, that is what I spend most of my time on. It's nice to have some assumptions be correct. Uh, but this is a topic that, that you and Matt bring up all the time on the Perfect RIA as well of even though there's so many different topics you cover as you work with advisors, tax planning is a recurring theme. And so I'm glad that we can kind of go just a little bit deeper today and talk about, okay, what, what do we really mean for an advisor when we talk about tax planning? Because it can feel kind of ambiguous. Yeah, I think there's many levels to this, right? Um, I almost think it's going to be, I, I love to use different examples as well to kind of draw things together. So when I talk to other advisors about estate planning, almost every single advisor says they do estate planning. Mm -hmm. And then when I ask, tell me what that means or what you do, basically you ask them if they have a will, health care directive or durable power of attorney. And if not, you tell them to go see an attorney fascinating. That's not what I would consider doing estate planning. Now, some people do, right? Maybe that's yeah. your education level. Maybe that's as much as you can do. Uh, so that's one level. And I'm going to call that kind of the basic level that's going to be there of estate planning. And that can go all the way through the, the doctorate master level over here, <laughs> which would be like almost drafting documents and working with that, funding the trust, creating the estate plan, minimizing the taxes, doing all that stuff. And there's many levels in between that area just on estate planning. And by the way, if you haven't looked at the class that we're putting together with Rod Zeeb uh, on estate planning, you need to do that. He's a phenomenal estate planning attorney. Well, former estate planning, he's what is he said, recovering estate planning attorney <laughs> on going through this. Um, but there's so many different levels in all of these areas. Estate planning is one and then tax planning is the other. So, Stephen, let's look at this in a couple different ways. I'd love to pick your brain on this. What are the different levels of tax planning? So what's the bare minimum that advisors should be doing, period, and then let's kind of bring that up one layer at a time, not to kind of overwhelm our listeners. What do you think? Yeah. So to start with, let's just acknowledge that every financial advisor is doing some kind of tax planning already, even Whoa. if they're not calling it that. Oh, their compliance says you don't do tax advice uh, or tax planning. I know what their compliance says. I also talked to enough advisors in enough different places to we can use a sim really simple example. This is probably more what you're asking for of let's actually get started into the tax planning of e even if you are recommending how much to contribute to an IRA or whether to contribute traditional or Roth. I mean, th these things have tax impacts, right? If you're a financial advisor doing anything with a person's money, so any anything you're doing is going to have a tax impact. So, so let's just throw out for a second that there's advisors who aren't doing tax planning. There's just ones who are doing it consciously and ones who are playing pretend. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. There's Steven Jarvis throwing some shade out there. Yeah, so, so that's one end of the spectrum of, hey, you're already doing tax planning, you're just not doing it consciously. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the, the spectrum, you, you might default and think, well, the other end of the spectrum is tax preparation. But I don't think I would put that as the other guardrail because I want the Agreed. other end of the spectrum to be the highest and best possible thing we can be doing for a client. And yes, tax pre preparation is towards that end of the spectrum of making sure it gets done, not necessarily doing it yourself. But tax preparation falls short of the goal line of doing great tax planning. You know, and it's kind of like, and again, I'll use a different analogy right here. When people, uh, we're, we're talking and working with advisors and they're like, you know what? I can't delegate because of all these other reasons. If I don't do it myself, it'll never get done, da, da, da. And tell them, look, you already delegate every, almost everything in your life. And yeah. you're like, no, I don't. Really? Did you make your clothes? Did you make your car? Did you create the gas that went into your car? Right. How are you got utilities? Right. You delegated all of these responsibilities out. You only do point zero 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 one percent of your own stuff compared to what it takes to make you thrive. 
right? So we already delegate in all these other ways. And the same thing, we already are doing tax planning in so many different ways. I really like your thought in there. I just want to pull it out a little more about, is this a conscious Mm -hmm. decision or not? And if I may put it in a TPR term, are you getting dishwasher credit for it or not? Yeah. Right. Are you doing it subconsciously where the clients don't know you're doing it? Therefore, they don't know when to ask you questions and you're not getting credit for the work you're doing. Or are you doing it consciously where you're letting the clients know it's a value add that you're offering? You're getting the credit and you're in a place to help them in the future. Yeah. So if I if I was to put bookends on this spectrum, on the one side, it would be you're doing it. You're not conscious of it. That's that's the irresponsible. end. the other side, in my mind, would be something to the effect of you are taking responsibility for ensuring it happens and assist. you have a system set up for it being successful. Because there's gonna be lots of situations where, where you're, gonna, you're gonna delegate pieces of it to another professional, someone on your team. You, maybe you, don't, you honestly don't have the answer. It's a new situation you've come across. But to me, the advisors I work with who I would put on the, the pinnacle of doing tax planning, it's that, it's that commitment to seeing it through and the system for making it happen. I really like that, that process side of it is, is the question that's going to be there. Now, nowhere in there did I hear, or was <laughs> it just not paying attention, about the tax knowledge that a professional has to have in order to do this. So wh- why why wasn't that in there? Isn't, shouldn't that be a key factor in this? Uh, maybe according to some people, but that was intentional on my part that I left yeah. out the tax knowledge. Yeah. You, you do, there's not a certain level of tax nerdiness you need to achieve. Uh, oh, totally agreed. Yeah. You know, and, and people are going to measure this in different ways and most people measure it in whatever puts themselves in the best light. But that, that, that responsibility in that process is really what I'm going to focus on. Uh, and, and, you know, kind of as we get nuances within there, uh, there's got to be a commitment to continually learning and improving. You should be, you should absolutely be com- committed to enhancing your tax knowledge in the areas that, that apply to your clients. But this, this is to me where the spectrum gets interesting and where uh, advisors who feel like they're, they're maybe on the lighter end of the spectrum, um, who, who may, maybe they're a little adverse to even trying because they say, oh, that, that, that high end is so far away. It's not. You, you can make this commitment to being responsible for it. And then, and then you just need to start down this road. And maybe as you're starting down it, it's setting expectations with your clients that you want to be involved, that you're going to get tax returns for every client every year, and that you're going to do something with that. Even if that's something you do with it is you know, you can use the RTS 37 point checklist that you have some kind of checklist you use on every client, but you're, you're starting to build those reps. You're starting to build the, that knowledge and then you're bringing in professionals to help with the rest. I really like that, right? So how often can we hide behind our lack of knowledge is an excuse why not to do that when really this is no, you have to do something and, you know, start moving down that direction and then improve upon it, right? And improve upon things you can control. If it's not in your bailiwick and you just don't want to become a tax expert, you don't have to become one to add massive value in taxes. What you do have to do is you do have to have a process for delivering tax value to clients, Mm -hmm. whether it's as simple as getting their tax returns, potentially getting RTS to get their tax returns, and then doing an 8821 so you can review things with them and have RTS helping with it. That is a process for success. It could be sending out a 1099 letter in January, which is what we highly recommend as a value add to your clients so they can know what tax forms they're going to get. Again, that did, sending out the 1099 letter is, is such a low bar. It's work, by the way, just mm-hmm. to be clear. Yeah. But it's such a low bar because it requires almost no tax knowledge to send that sucker out. Now, almost is not true because you got to know what a 1099R is versus a 1099. (laughs) So you got to have some tax knowledge, but it's for the CFPs, it's a really low bar of tax knowledge you got to get over. And the custodian gives you that information. Mm -hmm. So even if you're just doing that, you're helping with some type of tax planning. Yeah. And you've got to be in the top couple of percent of advisors across the country as far as what you're doing for tax planning. Because you see this more and more on advisors' websites that, oh, we do tax planning. But still, the vast majority of those advisors, as I dig deeper, they're, they're on this end of the spectrum where uh, maybe we ask a couple of questions and we move on. We're not owning the process. Um, you know, Mike, I know that you have phenomenal tax knowledge there and you've spent years developing that. Uh, you know, I, I would, I would bet on you against a lot of people in the industry, if not everyone. All right. This podcast is now a wrap. We send that to Matthew Jarvis. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Uh, and Matthew Jarvis is another good example of someone who has a, a really deep tax knowledge. Yes. The, the, where I'm going with this though, is to, to your point of the, the, that's, that's not the prerequisite to being great at tax planning for your clients. That that's intentionally, I didn't put the other end of the spectrum as Micah level knowledge. Mm-mm, um, mm-mm. Our good friend, friend, Ben Brandt has a fantastic process for delivering value on tax planning. That's right. And he is a self-proclaimed non-tax expert. 
Yep. Uh, he, he proudly will tell you, I'm not a tax expert, but I've developed a process and I've partnered with professionals yes. who can make sure my clients are getting massive value through tax planning. And so you can take that, right? And we could take, let's pick on Ben and let's pick on me just for fun in, in that side of it. And say, so, okay, to the end value of the client, which tax, let's, let's just say we're using the same process. I'm sure there's slight nuances, mm -hmm. but Ben is a, has a rock star practice, right? Yeah. Okay, does it really matter if Ben's giving the advice or if I'm getting the, giving the advice in taxes or if the client is getting the value of the advice? What's the most important thing? Yeah, it's the value to the client. Duh, yeah, absolutely. It's the value to the client. It's nothing to do with who is saying that, right? Which is the phenomenal part, Stephen, about what you said, which is creating the process. Because mm -hmm. by creating the process, now you get a harness in that ability. One of the things I'm going to say that the advisor needs to be conscious of, at least I need to be conscious of inside of that too, is this is where your ego can creep in and mm -hmm. really get you in trouble. When you try to take credit for things that you don't fully understand, that can get you in trouble. Right. So if you just all of a sudden want to grab, boy, I see this a lot, uh, where advisors will grab something that they really like, they'll white label it with their own logo, <laughs> then they'll send it out, but they really won't know what it means. Yeah. That's a great way to get in trouble. Right. Uh, versus just saying, no, we partner with this other company and they're the experts and we like their information. Another way is you got to be willing when you're partnering with someone in this process to make sure you share credit. Mm -hmm. And Stephen, as you and I work together, one of the things I, I try to tell myself consistently is I am all about the client getting the value, yep. right? And if it's RTS, which is delivering the value to the client, it's not directly coming through my hands. Great. Right now, part of me is a control freak. I want, I, I do, right? Like internally, I want to control that entire process and I want to do it, but that's not the best outcome for the client. So I got to check my ego in that. And I got to say, no, no, no. I want a process of success for our clients and delivering tax value. And it's fan friggin' tastic when we put RTS in this mix to really help deliver that value to clients on a very consistent basis. Yeah, it's interesting. That, that actually cuts both ways at times. I, I've been on calls with with our taxpayers and their advisors where we'll go through uh, different tax planning situations where I, I'm the one sharing the information. Uh, and then we get to the end of the call and it, it's a little bit flattering, but also a little bit backhanded that the, the, the client will say, will turn to the advisor, you know, on Zoom. They'll say, oh, Mr. Advisor, thank you so much for introducing me to Stephen. Uh, but then they go on and on about how great the advisor is for making it. I, I just spent all this time doing all the tax planning work right, right. And, the, and the advisor's getting all the credit for making an introduction. And there's part yep. of me that thinks, wait, what? Where's my thank you? But again, this, this it's a collaboration. It's, yes. it's teamwork. And at the end of the day, the client wins. And so I'm good with it. That is something that we just have to be very cognizant of in making sure we're outlined for that and understanding we're still human. We still have these emotions and what's a best way to address them right? And say, no, nope, this is the best outcome for it. So this is all about that process. Who's going to be in that process? How is it going to be there? But Stephen, the other thing I would say, which is really big, love your input on this one, is communicating timelines to client and when follow-up is going to happen, whether communicated or non-communicated with the client is really, really important in delivering that value. Yeah, that's a great point to bring in there. I, I, I had a thought that I almost felt like was, was going on a tangent, but it really loops kind of into this of one of the reasons I'm okay with that shared credit is because the advisors I partner with, uh, we also share responsibility. And so it, there's those moments where uh, it can be like, well, sh who should have gotten the credit? Great, we can move past that. And and where where I know that it, it's all about the client is when I'm responsible for the tax savings. You're responsible for the tax losses. Is, is that is that possible? No, no, that's not what you meant by no, show. That's, that's not what I'm I meant. Sorry. But as you, right. as you talk about communicating timelines, is communicating expectations that, that this is a team effort, and that that I I know that if if something when inevitably something doesn't go quite as intended in life that this is also going to be a team approach for dealing with those situations as well. This isn't going to be finger pointing of, of you telling your client, oh, well, go talk to Steve and he's the one who messed that up. That this is, okay, here's what we are going to do to solve this. Uh, and for me, that's that's the balance of, of, the, of the credit and the responsibility of, of this is all teamwork to help the client. Uh, and a key piece of that is setting those expectations, making sure the client understands how they're going to get that next follow up, where that's going to come from, who's responsible for the next steps, uh, and and who knowing who they can reach out and how they can reach out to keep moving things forward. Well, you just hit on a huge part that I want to pull out about working with COIs, center of influences, is understanding that the center of influences. I hate using this term, want a safe space, want a, a safe environment <laughs> that they can communicate with you in. No one wants to be thrown under the bus. Yeah. I was interviewing a new estate planning attorney. And when we were chatting with him and kind of going through what our process was, I did not highlight enough that him and I would chat in advance of the client's situation mm -hmm. to know what my recommendations were going to be. 
he was worried, which I'm really super glad he brought this up and articulated to me. He was worried that I was pretty much going to present things uh, in front of him to a client and kind of throw him under the bus one way or another, whether he agreed or disagreed, which is not my process. So I clearly failed to communicate that. Super glad he said that. He goes, no, no, no. In our communication process, I want to communicate professional to professional first. Mm -hmm. Let's get on the same page together. And we are a team unified with the client presenting something. We are not two opposing forces. If we disagree on something, pointing at Stephen right now because we're just face to face. If Stephen and I disagree on something, well, then fantastic. We need to get together and let the evidence show its show, show the proof. Yeah. Right? That, that's what I'm looking for, especially in taxes. Right? Is what is the evidence? What's the goal for the client? And what's the evidence that supports this? And that's the path that we're going to go down. And then we need to be on a united front. Same thing with estate planning. Same thing with the investment. Same thing with any other professional that I'm going to deal with. We need to be on that same page first before we go on. And when we have that, we have this higher level of trust and communication. Then when something happens with a client that's not supposed to, our process is number one, fix it, mm -hmm. find out what happened, yeah. prevent it next time. That's the second step. But the first thing, I don't, I don't, I, boy, you talk about pissing me off real fast is if all of a sudden something happens to the client and everyone starts talking about, well, who did what, mm. which doesn't happen in my team, which is fantastic. I'm like, no, all I want to hear about is how we're fixing this. Yeah. Then we will have a discussion as to where that process broke down and how we're going to address it going forward. Yeah. So many great things in there in, in our onboarding process for bringing on new uh, premier members who the advisors we partner with on taxes. That's a conversation that I have with every single one of them of, I can't promise we're always going to agree, but I can promise that we're never going to fight in front of a client. If, mm -hmm. if there are times where we have a difference of opinion, we are going to sort that out. But setting, if you don't, I mean, to your, to your story with the estate planning attorney, if you don't set those expectations, if you don't get that out there ahead of time, you're, you're leaving people to guess. Yep. It's just like when we work with clients, we're going to set expectations as to how the process works. Uh, and uh, honestly, I like setting that expectation up front that there there could be a time where we don't agree, where we need to sort these things out because not everything is cut and dry. There are going to be times where that's why we're all professionals and make money doing this because it's not easy. We need people who can who can come and look at these things critically uh, and have these discussions. So back to the process side that the advisor can control regardless of your tax knowledge is communicating timelines. Mm -hmm. Easy example of that we would like to review a client's tax return. So I, I think one of the things that um, advisors can easily fall into the habit of doing, which is really bad, is asking the client to supply documentation, then the client doesn't know you did anything with it, mm, Yeah. right? Uh, and just for me on the other end, when I'm working with other professionals, that just pisses me off. Like I had to go out of my way to send this to you and then you don't even tell me you got it or what you're doing with it. So this was a waste of my time. Um, and I think our clients can feel that same way. So anytime they provide us with information, they upload something to us, et cetera. In our process, we're going to communicate with them that we what we received, not we received what you uploaded, by the way. And this is a little broader than taxes, right? Because they uploaded 12 things. We got four. Yeah. Now they think we got all 12 things, right? So great news. We got the four documents you uploaded, which was only the first page of your 1040, right? And these other things. And then we're going to say what other information we need. And of course, the reason we changed our process is because that blew up in our face. The client thought they had uploaded everything. We had said we received everything, mm -hmm. but that didn't mean the same thing. So number one, we're going to communicate what we received from the client. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing we're going to do is what are we doing with that information? Let's take a tax turn. Uh, they upload it to our system. Um, so it's a, it's a DIY client, right? Or they may have a different CPA because it's different when we work with you guys, which is fantastic. We're talking about tax services. So it's, it's a DIY client. They do their taxes and travel tax. They upload their draft for us to review. We're going to say, hey, great. Thank you for uploading your draft of your 2021 tax return. It's Mike is going to review it by X date, by Thursday of next week. And this is when we're going to get back to you. Now, why do we say that? Well, let's say they're going to meet with a, another CPA. They're going to meet with somebody else and they need to an answer by Tuesday. Right. Well, I need to set that expectations of when we're going to review that. Now, this gives the client the opportunity to step back and says, whoa, that actually doesn't work for me. I'm headed out of town. I'd love to file my taxes on Tuesdays. Anyway, I could review it sooner. Now, perfect. We get to escalate this. If I just would have said in this process, if our arms would have said, hey, great, Mike is going to review it. The client thinks that's today. Yeah. Like actually 10 minutes ago. And it should already be a response from Micah that, that it's done. Right. So we need to set those time expectations. So the same thing in your process. So it, no matter where you are in your tax knowledge, anytime you're doing something with a client tax wise, set the expectations of when, what you're going to do with that document that you get, when you're going to follow up. And maybe the follow up is you're just going to follow up with a CPA. So Stephen, let's take RTS out of the picture just for a discussion. We'll talk about how you guys fit in, which is a little nicer, but. If you're working with an outside CPA and they're doing the taxes, I think maybe my process would be, hey, I saw you uploaded everything to your CPA. We're going to follow up with them to the state. And these are some questions we have. And then we'll let you know by X when this is going to happen. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's so interesting seeing how, you know, watching his advisors try to fit into the process with other CPAs because it's just, 
you know, we've, we've got our little cartoon of, of the windshield versus the rear view mirror. Uh, and advisors and, C and CPAs can do so much together to add value to clients. But I, I guess my, my caution is no going in that if you're going to try to establish those relationships, it's going to take time and you're going to have to drive it. That yes. Absolutely, that can fit. And it can be a win for the CPA as well, which is something you need to highlight as you're building that relationship, that it's all about it's all about the messaging and making it clear to everyone involved how, how, it's, a, how it's a win. This isn't, hey, uh, Mrs. CPA, you need to let me be involved in the process so that you don't screw it up for my clients. Uh, you know, Michael, you have great language around this, especially as you look at draft tax returns for your clients of, hey, I, I know you get, uh, or I know my clients get a lot of documents. I, I know that for me, they don't always bring all of them in. I just wanna make sure that you got all the information you needed to get everything done correctly. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's gonna be a building process. It's gonna take time. But the, the, the way you laid that out is absolutely something that can happen if you can invest the time into building that relationship. Yeah, and this is, again, we're focusing on things in, in this episode that's less on tax knowledge and 100% in your control. And then the more tax knowledge you have, you want to sprinkle and dismiss. Well, fantastic. Then you just add those different layers to it. But that process needs to remain the same. Um, another thing that we do with clients is, is Stephen, I love your thought on, on the CPA, on the collaboration. Do you have any clients that it's tough to get information from in a timely manner? <laughs> uh, yeah, just a few. Just a few. Yeah. yeah. So on those few clients, right, that we have, one of the things that I, I like to do is when I know they're coming up for an appointment, our relationship managers reach out to the CPA in advance mm -hmm. and say, hey, we have this client coming in at this date. Is there anything that you need from them to do a tax mm -hmm. projection, do the tax return, et cetera? Um, especially for our business clients, our self-employed clients, there's always stuff that they are delinquent in getting to the CPA. And now all of a sudden, I mean, this is zero tax knowledge that you have to have to do this. Just know that they're working with it. Mm -hmm. And now we get to reach out to the CPA. And guess what, Stephen, if you were working with a, a client and the advisor reach out, says, hey, I got a client meeting with this guy coming up in two weeks. Is there anything you need that I can get for you to make your life easier? How would you think about that? Oh, I'd be elated. That would that'd be like Christmas came early. Yep. And this is an easy thing that advisors can do, reaching out and helping build that relationship, right? And then again, we just add that to our list of things we want for the client to come in. Mm -hmm. Then when we get that, we supply whatever information we got to the CPA. Of course, we already have releases on file, all those fun things, right? Yeah. For compliance. So, but those are really critical things in the process that you can 100% control. Yeah. And Mike, I know you just said that this episode isn't so much about tax knowledge and, and I won't get into specific areas, but I, I do want to just throw out there that you absolutely can own improving your tax knowledge wherever oh, you're yeah. currently at. And as I work with advisors, I would say one of the biggest things that, that oh. every advisor listening to this can do is get more reps in reviewing your client's tax returns. There are great courses out there. There's great videos and things you can watch online. But really where I see advisors who are really pushing the boundaries of, of how well they understand the things applicable to their clients, it's the advisors who spend time in their client's tax returns. And if, if you're really new to this and you're not sure where to start, uh, I mean, absolutely find a, well, maybe not even find a course. If you've, if you've tried that before, find another advisor, you know, is doing this, find a peer, find somebody in your mastermind that the next time you're working together, you can say, uh, uh, Hey, here's this. Uh, in fact, I just, I was, we, we mentioned our friend, Ben Brandt. I was just with him a couple of weeks ago. He's got a mastermind he's put together. And so one of the advisors there brought a tax return and it was for one of his clients. We went through it together and said, here are the things that I would look at. And it was this real eye opening moment for him of, Oh, that makes so much sense. And we weren't going deep. But I was just saying, as we go through the tax return, line by line of the 1040, here are the things that we can pull out. And so that didn't make him an expert overnight, but it gave him some direction. And now as he gets more clients tax returns, he's going to get those reps in. He's going to increase that knowledge. That's something that he can completely own. I love it. Now, Stephen is probably too kind to be talking about how he would make this process so much better with retirement tax services. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to help out with that. <laughs> um, one of the things that I have enjoyed about working with retirement tax services and going through this process is it is cut down on my team's need because I'm not doing the follow up. My team is right. It's cut down on my team's need to follow up with CPAs to get tax returns, to get drafts and to have this in communication. Because on your portal that you guys have created, which is fantastic, I get to see the client's documents that they upload to you, mm -hmm. which really helps me, by the way. You know, survivor benefits. You want to calculate, right? Oh my gosh, they got pension income of 80000 but how many pensions is that, right? Sometimes we don't do a great job of documenting. Well, guess what? That's going to be on 1099Rs. Yep. And if you have access to that tax information, now I can look in there and I can pull all those 1099Rs on that particular client and I can look into these things, right? So not even on taxes, that's just retirement income that could help me out. So I love access to that. I also love the fact that when you guys draft a return, you send it to the advisors first 
for us to be able to review, give us a decent amount of time. And if you don't get any communication, you're still going to reach out to the client to get it filed, but you allow us first crack to review it because the last thing I want to do is be surprised. Let's say we did some capital gains harvesting and you know we did it early on in the year. And let's say that they owed $10,000 in taxes. We had the money set aside to pay it. The client's not going to remember that. There's mm -hmm. one client in particular, actually, that was a mutual client that didn't remember that, right? And the last thing I want is the client to call me up and says, hey, Steven just gave me my tax return and you owe me 10 and, and I owe $10,000 because of investments. Yeah. What right? the heck? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And Micah, I'm, I'm glad that's such a win for you. And that's obviously part of why it's in the process. It's also a win for my team. We love being able to send draft returns to the advisors because uh, the IRS did not design any tax return or tax forms with, with the taxpayer in mind. These, these forms are not <laughs> set up I've never thought about it like that. That's hundred percent the case. Yeah. So when we look at like 1099 R's amongst other things, and there's, there's a lot of important information that's not there. I think sometimes tax preparers get a bad rap for tax planning strategies that don't get reported correctly, but a lot of times they just weren't even given all of the information. And so there were definitely times with clients that we shared. I can think of other examples with, with other RTS premier members where we prepped the draft tax return. We share it on our portal, both with the advisor and the client to say, here's our timeline. We're going to move forward, but we'd love input. Uh, and I love it when the advisor comes back and says, oh, it looks like you might not have been aware of these couple of things. And we'll say, oh, you're right. We weren't aware of that. We'll get that reflected in the tax return and we'll move on. But yeah. there are things that we would have no other way of knowing. And so it, it's a huge win for, for our team as well, which all of this just ultimately means it's a huge win for the client because now it's more accurate. We're avoiding amendments. Uh, it, it's just, it's a better experience for everyone. You know, and I know in one particular client as well, you had an upcoming meeting with them, but unfortunately I was kind of jammed in between appointments and I wasn't able to, to reach out to them in advance and they had a decent tax bill. Mm -hmm. um, and when we were chatting about it, I just sent you the message says, hey, when you're talking with Bob and Sue, feel free to remind them that we chatted and we had already set aside X amount of dollars to pay taxes. It's already in cash. It's ready to go to the IRS. So it's not going to come out of their pocket. And um, I would just imagine, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I'd imagine that's a much better conversation to say, hey, we already talked with your advisor and they already have the money set aside versus oh by the way you owe 15 grand oh yeah ab absolutely because <laughs> this is this is why there's a lot of tax preparers and cpas who don't play nice with advisors is mm -hmm. because they've gone into those meetings where they have to tell a client they owe a bunch of money and they have no context for yep. has the advisor prepared them for this is their money set aside for it they just feel like the bearer of bad news and they're, they're a lot more likely to just throw the advisor under the bus and so being able to go in with context and not not just on hey that money was set aside for for you to pay mike and his team will help you out with that but the other, it makes that review process a lot more enjoyable for our team as well. When we can highlight where great tax planning is coming through on the yes. tax return, even if they don't, even if they don't owe, we can highlight and say, Hey, uh, here's where, you know, Mike and his team had worked with you to harvest some capital gains this year to offset those losses from the prior year. Here's that happened. And here's how much you saved as a result. Or we can see here, this is where your QCD was reported. And we can see that it wasn't included in your taxable income. How great mm -hmm. is that? And so we can highlight those things for a client. And so now instead of a tax return review being just this end of the year scorekeeping where we're hoping the client's not going to be too mad they owe money in taxes, it's it, we can highlight positive things in there as well. Yeah, Stephen, and, and you know, we're going to get on action items here in just a second, but that is such a key thing. Now, again, that is some more work for the advisor mm -hmm. to make sure we're communicating those strategies, which is why I like the RTS portal that I'm able to easily submit those things and put it on there so you guys can see it. But this is really important, regardless of what CPA you work with, advisors have to be sharing the tax strategies mm -hmm. that they're implementing. Hey, we did a massive Roth conversion because next year they're going to be on Irma. And then when they're 72, their RMDs are going to permanently kick them up into a higher Irma mm -hmm. bracket. Therefore, we're going to do mo mo big Roth conversions. We're going to trigger a little higher Irma for a couple of years to get it reduced for the next 30, right? I want to communicate those things with the CPA. I want to communicate those things with the clients, but you know, making sure we're all on that same page. And one of the things I love about communicating tax planning strategies is as much as I would love to be right all the time, mm -hmm. I'm not. And this allows now a second set of eyes for Stephen, you to be able to review it and says, you know, my God, that, that is one way to do it. Right. But you have, you thought about a, B and C, right. And I love it. That's fantastic. Push back on it. Let's make sure we're giving the client the best advice possible. But if you, the advisor, are not communicating what your plan is with the tax professional, you're not getting that benefit of the second opinion. Yeah, so many great points in there. 
there's there's something about having a second professional involved in the answer that I think also makes it even when the answer is no, we can't do anything about that. I'm, I'm thinking of a particular client where they uh, sold sold a second property and had this big gain that they were really hoping they were going to be able to avoid all the taxes on it. And so, of course, they come to you. They know that you want to talk about tax planning. And say, Micah, help us avoid all these taxes. And you say, well, great. Let me check with Stephen. We'll, we'll, we'll explore this. And so when we come back and say, you know what, we looked into this for you. Yep. Uh, we, we really analyzed all the, the, the possibilities. But unfortunately, the way the tax code is set up, you, you are going to owe taxes on that gain. But for they're just the kind of the psychology behind it, that, that now they know that not only did they ask their advisor, their advisor's checking with another professional, we've exhausted all their options. Okay, we need to pay the taxes we owe. You know, and think about that too, right? Because the client in this particular case, Bob and Sue, by the way. Yep. <laughs> um, and so they were, when they sold their place, they had really thought that because they were investing the money in another property right away, mm. that they were going to avoid yeah. the taxes. Yeah, it was a second home. Doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> uh, you know, so it was kind of cut and dry as soon as I, as soon as we heard it. Yeah. But in their mind, this should have been a tax-free transfer. Yeah. So if you just would have come back right away, I mean, the psychology side of it, you would have come back right away and says, no, you're totally wrong. They'd be like, Mike, I didn't look into it. Mm -hmm. We're so right. Now they would have went and spent their wheels somewhere else trying to find a reason. But Stephen, to your point, just to, to highlight on that, to say, you know what, that's, that's, let me go ask Stephen. Let me go talk with CPA. Let me bring another professional. Let's put our heads together and let's see if we can find a way to save you some money and taxes. Well, then fantastic. Even though we kind of know the answer, we're still going to look into it. We're still going to go through it. It's going to help with that peace of mind with the client. Yeah. And, and that's a sincere request and a sincere action that we're taking. Anytime yeah. a question comes in, I, I'm not, I'm not just dismissing and saying, oh, I already know that things should, the tax code is 80,000 pages long. There's going to be some things that are definitely I'm more comfortable with and I'm more confident right out of the right, gate, right. but still great. Let's, let's look into it. Let's double check for this client. Uh, it's a huge value add. Awesome. All right. Well, we could nerd out about taxes all day, <laughs> uh, but we need to get on to some action items that advisors can implement. So Steven, you are the guest, so you get to go first. So uh, what's an action item our listeners could do this week to improve their practice? Perfect. So the first action I would recommend is that you get your calendar out and you time block tax planning. Ooh, I like that, that one. That's it, what you do do inside that time block is going to be different depending where you're at on that spectrum currently. But that's that's got to be the first step. So you give it a place to live and that you don't just listen to Micah and I talk and think, oh, yeah, I'll get to that someday. You won't. You'll listen to us talk again in six months. You'll be like, oh, that's right. I didn't do any of those things. So get out your calendar, block time out so that you can start taking those next steps on wherever you're at in the spectrum. I really like that. All right. Second action I'm going to say is a process of success for taxes, right? And so again, this needs to be a process that you can 100% own and control, setting expectations, setting timeline, asking for things, doing follow-ups, all of which you can do. So it doesn't have to be super complex. If you have no process, make it kind of three steps, right? Make it number one, you know, introduce yourself to the, the CPA, the COI or whoever that's going to be. Number two, ask for the client's tax return, follow up with the client about different things you're going to be talking about with taxes, et cetera. This can be a very basic process. If you already have a process, then print it out, go to your receptionist and ask her without showing her, uh, ask them, what is the process? <laughs> and if they cannot tell you, then I, I got this from the great book, uh, Turn the Ship Around, then you need to certify, not brief them on what the process is. If you tell them what the process is, you've already told them, they don't know, you need to certify them on it. They need to be at a level where they can explain to you what that process is. Why? Because who's doing 90% of the process? It's not you as the advisor. Yeah, so to tag on to that thought process, the next action item I would recommend is that you have someone on your team Go and check how many of your clients you actually have tax returns for. That's a good one. We, we, we bring this up all the time that you need to be getting tax returns for all of your clients every year. And I have a lot of advisor. Oh, yeah, I do that. Uh, and then when I start digging, oh, oh, great. Let's look at that client's tax. Oh, well, I don't have their tax return. So, so great. Let's take the guesswork out of it. Have someone on your team go check how many of your clients you actually have tax returns for. And then maybe this is one of the things that lives inside that time block you've already put on your calendar is you, wherever you're at on the spectrum, you absolutely have to have a tax return for every client every single year. Absolutely love it. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. For more information about Stephen Jarvis, you can visit retirementtaxservices.com. And until next time, happy planning. Happy tax planning. Hold on before we go. Something that you need to know. This isn't tax legal or investment advice. That isn't our intent. The information designed to change lives. Financial planning can make you thrive. Start today, don't think twice. Be a better husband, father, mother, and wife. <laughs>